So, look at these answers. A says multiplication does not take very large time. It is the division operation and the addition operation which is time consuming. This is pure humbug, pure nonsense. It is traditionally known that the time required to do computations is roughly the smallest for addition and subtraction and largest for or much larger for division and multiplication. So, multiplication and division time does take long time. So, this is clearly not the answer. B says since i and j are varying, computing i square, j square each takes much longer than n square. It is very sad indeed that my colleague teachers, many of them think that B is the right answer. Please understand that varying variation of i and j has nothing to do with the operation of computation of i square and j square. Let us go back to the formula and just check this. Please note that i and j are varying only once in the iteration. We are talking about the computation time consumed while executing this comparison within which we are doing this complex computing. When the computer comes to this particular point for executing or evaluating this expression, at that point the value of i, value of j and value of n2 or earlier the value of n all are fixed. i and j are not varying when I am doing the computation. In fact, when I am doing the computation, I cannot compute the multiplication sum or anything of two numbers which are actually changing while I do the computation. So, this is incorrect. It is actually a confusing statement. When I say varying, some, some of us believe that there is something drastically wrong. That is all humbug. What is happening is that it is just a multiplication. Whether i has varied earlier and n has not varied earlier has, has no significance. Consequently, the answer b is also not correct. In short, whether i and j were varying or whether they were not varying, the time required to multiply i by i, the time required to multiply j by j and the time required to multiply n by n will exactly be same. There will be no difference whatsoever. I will first look at answer d. I do not know and also I cannot guess. As a novice, you will often find the first year students giving this answer. The correct answer is however c. Our program somehow figures that n is not changing, so it calculates n square only once and uses that value repeatedly. I suspect that those of the colleague participants who gave this answer C have probably done a course in optimizing compilers. When you compile a C or C++ program, uh, modern compilers optimize the code. What is the optimization? Compilers when they translate our program instructions into machine instructions, compilers are also worried about generating instructions which are as efficient as possible. So, what the modern compilers do is, they are able to identify iterations easily anyway. They look at any expression inside the deeper iteration and they analyze whether within the iteration the value of the concerned operands is changing or not changing. They find out very quickly that n is constant, n is not changing at all. And therefore, a compiler determines that look, I need not waste time in computing n into n every time. So, what the compiler does, what we did ourselves just now, I go back to this program, we actually replaced this n into n by n2 and put outside all these iterations a statement int n2 equal to n square. Compiler does this. Compiler actually generates an artificial variable, allocates it a location, calculates the value of n square, puts that result in n2 and wherever there is a reference to n square inside this in, in this case it is only once, but there could be many, it will simply replace that reference not by instructions which will compute the multiplication, but by a reference to a variable which has been so artificially created. Obviously, uh, some of us may be teaching these in compiler courses or some of us may have studied it in the compiler courses. Since for most others who are plain good programmers and programming teachers, Without the knowledge of optimizing compilers, it is hard to guess and that is the reason why C answer cannot be guessed unless it is known ahead of time. However, what is important is that even though I may not be able to guess the answer C correctly, 
I should be able to figure out that A and B are wrong. If I do not know optimizing compilers, my right response should be as a student, I do not know and also cannot guess. But if I know the compilers, C should be the correct answer. And now look at what else can we do, because we tried this, we replaced n square by some variable n2. Unfortunately, when we run the program with time command, it still seems to be taking the same amount of time. So, the optimizing compiler had already stolen our brilliancy from us and we do not seem to have anything better. But as a good programmer, we will not quit. We will say, can we do something better? So, we examine this program again. We find that there is nothing much that we can do. Then we go back to the basic concept. What is the basic concept? First, this is the uh, uh, computation that is being done and this is the computation being done in the nested iteration. So, clearly I have to reduce this computation somehow. Now, okay, uh, this is repeated. I, I do not calculate n square again all right, but instead of considering the square, we can consider only a triangle, half of that square with area pi by 8 and this should reduce computations by half or even more. So, anyway, here is an idea that instead of considering the square, I can consider only a triangle. There is another modification that I can do here. If I do i equal to 1 to n and j equal to 1 to n, I am looking at all the points within the square. But if I do i equal to 1 to n and j equal to i to, sorry, j equal to i to n. So, I do not start j equal to 1. If i is 1, then j will start with, if i is 5, then I will start j with j with 5. Why? I am actually saying that I have a square which is symmetric around its diagonal. So, I can just calculate the triangle. Notice that by doing this, I will be calculating either the upper triangle or lower triangle depending upon how you look at it. Since triangle is half of the square, I am doing half the computation. And it does not matter whether n square has been removed outside by the compiler or by me, but I do both these things. So, in short, I have made just one modification here. But since I am calculating only half the area, instead of multiplying it by 4, I have to multiply it by 8. Common sense, my estimation technique remains sense, I print the value of pi. Now, I execute this version. If I execute it, I have shown execution time only for 20,000 and 50,000. We do not remember the 20,000 times, but if you see the time taken for executing this algorithm with n equal to 50,000. Please note that means I am examining 50,000 into 50,000 by half points. Now half, because earlier I was examining 50,000 by 50,000. I am examining only points within the triangle. Now, I see the user time is 13.461 seconds. You will recall earlier it was in the range of 26, 27 seconds. It has indeed reduced by half. There is an appreciable reduction. Believe me, doing this Mara Mari for reducing the time amount by here, by there, etcetera, etcetera may not may appear very relevant, but I will tell you from my experience in the real world that our students who pass out and join companies and write programs do not have the efficiency of algorithm in their mind at all. And therefore, the programs that they write cause a lot of performance degradation in actual life. I have been a researcher in performance evaluation much of my earlier life and I can tell you from the industry interaction that I had that while people tend to blame the hardware is slow or people tend to say that the database is not performing very well, the fact of life is that 80 to 85 percent of the time, if an application is not working properly at the desired speed, the reason is bad application programming. And who writes those application programs? The students whom you and I teach. I would therefore submit that it is important for us to even formally get at least some elementary notion of efficiency introduced in the very first course in program. At IIT, I have found that by this simple discussion in just one of the lectures, people understand this and then subsequently in the lab, 
we tell them, okay, compile your program, but run it with the time command and see how long it takes. And on the same machine, we make different students' programs run uh, and compare against each other. So, in general, the habit of thinking about efficiency of the algorithm gets ingrained into them while they are writing their elementary programs. There is a little more to this notion. I usually use this opportunity to talk to my first year students on some elementary concepts of time complexity. I say that there are two ways of looking at the time taken by a program to execute. One is the micro view. That is the view that we just took. We look at the time taken by each instruction in the program to execute, number of times that instruction is executed. That is how we said that uh, if, I, if I calculate, if I run an iteration n square time, etc., etc., I am going to spend a lot of time computing. While the machine executes instructions in a few tens of microseconds or even in hundreds of nanoseconds, every instruction takes a different amount of time depending upon its nature. So, in micro view, remember the quiz that we had, addition takes more, subtraction takes less, etc., etc. Although the thumb rules have varied over the last uh, three decades of development of the computer hardware, but in general, if I define a unit time, whether it is 1 microsecond or 10 nanoseconds, it does not matter, but 1 unit time. And then based on the computer's hardware and the software which is implemented by the compiler, I find out how much time it takes to execute these different instructions. I will get a funny statistics uh, about the machine and the program behavior, which will be my micro view at the smallest level. So, this is an arbitrary thing I have written, some hypothetical comparative execution time. I consider assignment to take one unit. Then addition and subtraction takes two units time. Multiplication takes three units. Division takes five units. Comparison takes three units. Floating point operation as compared to integer operation takes five minutes, five times the integer operation. Some arbitrary numbers I have given. Indeed, even today for most of the machines, you can actually get these times. There used to be a very early benchmark which actually called MIPS or million instructions per second. And what it did is based on such computations, it decided defined a mix of instructions, some addition, some subtraction, some multiplication, some comparisons. And how many of the instructions of that mix are executed per second used to decide the speed of the processor of the hardware. And the first computer which crossed 1 million instructions per second from that MIPS, uh, from that uh, uh, mix was called a, a very fast computer, MIPS computer. Of course, modern computers can do a billion instructions per second, not million. Still, in terms of the approach to the problem of analyzing computer's performance, this micro view holds some sense. We can consider other operations which we have not yet studied such as reading from disk or assignment to an array element, these will take longer time. In this workshop itself, we are going to discuss arrays uh, in the uh, arrays and matrices over the next two days. But in any case, since most of your teachers, you are aware of the arrays. In my course, I usually take this particular lecture after arrays have been introduced. So, let us go ahead with it. I was saying that some operations such as reading from disk or assigning to an array element may take longer because in an array element, I might have something like A 3 star i plus j equal to something. Now, technically equal to something is merely an assignment operation. It should take one unit of time, but the computation of this index itself will take longer depending upon how many multiplications, additions I am doing. Of course, all these operations are intrinsically done by the CPU. A disk read operation would be 1000 to 10,000 times costlier and generally people do not take that into account while calculating the efficiency of an algorithm in this sense. Finally, we de define the time complexity of an algorithm in this fashion. Suppose in our program, there is an iteration which let us say executes n times, where n is some input value. Now, if the value of n largely determines the total amount of computation that is carried out by that algorithm, then we can call this n as size of the problem. 
notice how aptly this definition applies to the example that we are considering of estimating the value of pi. There we saw very clearly that as n increases the execution time increases and therefore n can be definitely called the representative size of the problem that we are trying to solve. Further, the number of computations which are required to execute the algorithm can now be expressed in terms of n which is the size of the problem. For our pi calculation, we know that the innermost iteration is executed either n square time or n square by 2 times or whatever. But some and maybe there are some other computations like addition, subtractions and so on. So, arbitrarily I might get an equation of the type 24 n square plus 78 n plus 180. These constants are arbitrary, they will depend, they will change from hardware to hardware. But roughly what we are saying is that if n is the size of the problem that my algorithm seems to take something a times n square plus b times n plus c. It is not difficult to arrive at such a formulation of computation time requirement of an algorithm. This incidentally is a polynomial of degree 2. If I have many nested iterations, say three level nested iteration, then I might have some uh, T n cube plus a n square plus b n plus c. So, I will have a polynomial where n will have a power of 3. What do these formulations and these constants mean in actual practice? In actual practice, if I want to compare two algorithms, I have written one algorithm to calculate pi which has n square by 2 iterations after this modification. A colleague of mine somewhere else has written an algorithm which calculates that by splitting the problem somehow neatly and calculating something for 1.5 n times something else for etc, etc, whatever, whatever. Uh, it might appear arbitrary at this stage, but those of you who have either studied or taught uh, data structures and algorithms would know that in case of sorting, even simple techniques could change the computational time requirement either by this amount or that amount and therefore, these things are possible. All that we are interested in telling our first year students through this example is a very simple thing that look in general by counting the number of multiplications, additions, etc. you are doing and by looking at the size of the problem, I can in general arrive at a formula with some constants which describes the total computation time that the whole algorithm will require. What we are talking about is comparing two algorithms which have different execution times. So, when comparing two algorithms, firstly we can get such expressions for each and then compare for specific values of n. This is a good example in my opinion. I take some arbitrary program called PROG1 and another arbitrary program called PROG2. These have nothing to do with PROG1 and PROG2 in our examples by the way. This is just some programs which are trying to do the same thing, but differently. Their algorithms are different. Imagine now that the time complexity of PROG1 is 24 n square plus 78 n plus 183. And imagine that the time complexity of PROC2 is 12586 n plus 6453. These are arbitrary examples, but the point that I am making is there is a different equation which describes that uh, the time complexity of an algorithm which is solving the same problem that the other one. In this case, it is 24 n square plus something n plus 183. In this case, it is a large number into n plus 6453. If we compare these two expressions, we notice that program 1 will run faster than program 2 up to a certain end. It is very obvious that if n is 1 for example, or n is 2, or n is 4, or n is 5, this expression will be much smaller than the second one. But you can clearly say that since this is a quadratic and this is a linear equation and the linear curve grows much slower than the quadratic. This will grow almost like, like an exponent. That means, there will be some value of n, some size of the problem. Beyond that size, algorithm 2 that is PROG 2 will always run faster than PROG 1, although these constants are very high. So, we note that whenever we get expression for complexity.
property of algorithm of this type, then for all values of n greater than a certain threshold value, an algorithm which has an expression with smaller degree of n will run faster. In short, this algorithm is more efficient than this. There is a very cute and nice notation to represent this fact in the theory of computations and in time complexity. The customary mechanism to compare algorithms is on the basis of their behavior when n is very large. Indeed, what the theory says is you calculate these expressions and take the limit as n tends to infinity. When n tends to infinity, that means n becomes very large, it is very obvious that the higher order term will predominate and therefore, program 1 is said to be order n square written as O n square whereas, program 2 is order n or order O n. This is a standard way of describing mathematically the time complexity of an algorithm. Although often this is not in the syllabus, but at one or two places I have seen the mention of time complexity. My submission to colleague teachers who are participating is that independent of whether it is in the syllabus or not, the first part namely the ability to measure the execution time using utilities such as time should be compulsorily taught to all of our students. And at least for those who wish or who wonder, okay, how do I compare this algorithm, you might either consider an extra lecture or why in a regular lecture tell them. Make sure that you do not ask any question in the examination. This is generally for the benefit of their better understanding. A very important concept is being told to our first year fresher students that the algorithms can be compared on the basis of their relative execution time and that when the problem size becomes large, then their behavior in the limit when n tends to infinity is what is considered the determining factor which describes what we call the order or big O in notation, these are all technical terms. So, one algorithm which is order n square, another algorithm which is order n, order n algorithm is always better. If there is an algorithm which is order n cube, then that is always costlier than anything else. In large problem solving such as sorting and searching, these orders are very important. So, uh, an algorithm for example, which is order log n is faster than an algorithm which is order n. Order n might appear to be the fastest, if you look at this expression. Okay. This is an order n algorithm, what can be faster than this? Only an algorithm which takes fixed time. There cannot be any algorithm which takes fixed time independent of the size of the problem. So, this appears to be faster, but that is not so. Consider proc 3 now, whose expression says k 1 times log n plus k 2. Now, if n increases linearly, log n increases still slower and therefore, you will find that that will be faster than this. Consequently, order or big O notation order n square, order n, order log n, etcetera, etcetera are the kind of representations for algorithmic complexity and the conclusion that we draw is that in general, our effort while writing our program should be A, try to reduce the order of complexity. So, if there are n cube operations that are happening, try to do that in n square operation or 5 times the n square operation. So, if you have 3 nested iterations, try to see that by some intelligent jugglery, you can remove those 3 nested iterations and do only 2 nested iterations, but do a whole lot of additional computation, it does not matter. Secondly, if it is impossible to reduce the order of complexity, then within the same order, try to reduce the coefficients of expression. Please note that the last modification that we discussed on our program to estimate the value of pi falls in the second category. Let me just go back very quickly and tell you why I say that. If I look at this program, earlier I was varying j from 1 to n, now I am varying j from i to n. Earlier I was doing n square iterations of this statement, now I am doing n square by 2 iterations of that statement. The order of complexity of this algorithm as compared to the earlier algorithm is same, both are order n square. But the factor constant, if it was 
n times n square and this is k2 times n square, very clearly k2 is half of k1, where I have simply chopped off half the computation. In real life, I submit that it may not be possible for normal programming that we do both in colleges or even later in the real life to be able to devise algorithms which will change the order of complexity of the algorithm on a possible way. However, it is always possible, always possible that any program that I have written, if I examine it carefully, I can always shave off a few unnecessary computations by intelligently tweaking the control structures or by shifting computing statements from here and there. Only thing is, I must look for them. And the fact is, I will never look for them if as my teachers, you never even suggested it to me when I was learning computer program. That is the reason why I suggest that at least some introduction to the time complexity of the algorithm. We may, if we wish, not call this time complexity and introduce theoretical concepts at all, but at least the need to evaluate the performance by measuring the execution time should be conveyed to our students. I am sorry, it is already 1 o'clock. Thank you.